Hello, welcome to another Black Horizons program. I'm your host, Humbert Rashid. Before we get to our topic today, I want to begin our program with a public service announcement. Uh, the, there will be a conference on Saturday, April 16, 1983, uh, held at the Joseph Howe School on Mainer Street in Halifax between 9.30 and 3 p.m., uh, dealing with the challenge to black women, hope for the future. This conference is sponsored by the Association of Black uh, Social Workers, and the keynote speaker for the conference will be uh, Betty Riley of Windsor, Ontario. Uh, in addition to the keynote speech by Ms. Rowley, there will be four concurrent workshops dealing with such topics as human rights and equality, opportunities and education, political awareness, and equality in employment. Once again, that conference will be held on Saturday, April 16th at the Joseph Howe School on Mainer Street in Halifax. On Wednesday night, March 23rd of this year, President Ronald Reagan, in a televised address to the nation, made certain references to the international airport now being constructed at Port Saline in Grenada. President Reagan gave the impression that uh, the airport was massive and well beyond the uh, requirements of Grenada, that it is intended for military purposes and as such constitutes a, thresh, a threat rather, uh, to U.S. security interests. The President added that this is a further example of a spreading communist threat to the United States from the Caribbean. Officials of Grenada were quick to respond, accusing Reagan of deliberately distorting events on the tiny Caribbean island in order to create a climate to justify a U.S.-backed invasion. In today's program, we'll discuss these events with Mr. Nazar Rizvi of Halifax. Mr. Rizvi is a member of the Caribbean Information Group. Uh, Brother Rizvi, welcome to the Black Horizons program. Thank you very much. Uh, you and I had the privilege uh, a year or so ago to do a program on Grenada, but for those people who didn't see that program and perhaps may not be that familiar with Grenada, I, I wonder if I could perhaps uh, initially get you to uh, locate uh, Grenada for us and tell us a little bit about the, uh, about the country, what its, uh, its size, its, uh, its population, the style of government, and so on. Uh, yes. Uh, unfortunately, a very small map, but nevertheless, you can see this is where Grenada is located, and it is surrounded by Barbados, St. Vincent, and Trinidad. So Grenada is one of the tiny islands. Its uh, population is 110,000. Uh, the island is 34 kilometers long and 19 kilometers wide. It is a very lush island. It is called Spice Island, and it is hilly, it has lakes. In the terms of natural beauty, Grenada is definitely is a, a very enjoyable, and you can call it a small paradise. Uh, it was like any other island uh, at one time. It was uh, under French, then later on taken over by British, and the population of Grenada, uh, they are all Christians. Uh, the Catholics are in majority. The next denomination is um, Anglican. So in that manner, Grenada is definitely a very good island. Mm -hmm. Well, turning now to the comments made by uh, President Reagan, could you perhaps uh, give us a clear idea of what specifically he, he uh, said or suggested about uh, Grenada's airfield? Uh, I think uh, um, uh, first I would um, answer your question concerning airport only, and then perhaps later on we would... Uh, investigate that it is more than airport. Yes. Uh, airport, which I have been very lucky to see myself uh, being constructed, it is not secret, it is open. All kinds of people who have visited Grenada, they have seen airport. Uh, uh, if uh, you travel to Grenada, as I did, you cannot get to Grenada without first going to Barbados, and there you have to spend your night, and sometimes maybe even uh, one or two days, and then you get a small plane to get to Grenada. With the result, Grenada is very isolated because it was kept as a part of British Commonwealth earlier on as British colonialism, and therefore Grenada was built, Canadian airport was built that day. Now, that way. Now, they want Grenada having its own airport. So they are building an airport which in size, uh, it is 
no bigger than for example, another island called Aruba, its population is only 60,000, its airport size is 9,000 feet. Uh, you take uh, Grenada, its population is 110,000 or 11,000 and its size is 9,800 feet. So, in that manner, the airport of Grenada is no bigger than any average airport uh, would be in that area. Uh, so, is, I do not see how uh, the size of the airport really can be objectionable other than few other things which go along with it in criticism. Yeah. Well, now, uh, President Reagan in his remarks uh, was talking about the uh, communist threat in the Western Hemisphere and so on. How was it that this airport got in involved in, in your opinion in that kind of uh, context? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, if one is not very careful, uh, one can support Reagan very easily uh, because of certain events which have taken place and are taking place. Number one, that when Grenada got this new progressive government under uh, Comrade Bishop, uh, it needed tremendous help to survive because it was in a very bad shape. And when they wanted that help, you can imagine what was the attitude of U.S. government because Eric Gary, who was already in U.S. and was U.S.-backed uh, dictator, uh, naturally uh, provoked United States not to support Grenada. So, Grenada had to look around purely for survival. The first thing they looked at was U.S. When it was denied, they went to European common market uh, so that they could have not only the airport, also their total economy reconstructed and they got some help. Even there, the USA sent a very um, important and um, a big delegate, delegation to block the aid. Then naturally, purely for survival, they got help from Cuba. Mm -hmm. and, the, uh, and that is how it all began. As soon as Cuban help came to Grenada, anything Grenada does, in other words, even if, they, even if the Maurice Bishop sneezes, it is considered hurricane. Mm -hmm. See? Yeah. Well, now, um, uh, Reagan in his remarks suggested that the airport uh, was excessive to the needs of uh, Grenada, that it was going to be used for military purposes. Uh, mm -hmm. They had this picture that was uh, taken from uh, a reconnaissance plane, presumably at high altitude and so on. Uh, is there any truth to the suggestion that the airport is being used for military purposes? Uh, I think the, in one word, there is no truth at all because I am one of those lucky person who has been there and have seen uh, anything which can be seen. In fact, seen. Is, isn't the airport open for anybody who the, wants to go? Anybody, and, and I think very interesting to note that the, the manager, the one who is in charge of building the airport, Ronald Smith, he is the first graduate of uh, Nova Scotia Tech. And when I met him, he embraced me because he considered me as a Nova Scotian and a great friend of Canada. The airport is open. The only thing which would be those people who are suspicious of Cuba t for no reason, it will be repulsive to them when they would see that the Cuban technicians are helping to build the airport because Grenada does not have enough technician to do all jobs. So, therefore, the Cuban workers are definitely there. As some of the correspondents of U.S., well, uh, like uh, Newsday magazine, has depicted how the Cuban workers are working. So, if the presence of Cuban in any shape and form is a communist conspiracy, then naturally, I do not think uh, Canada can escape because we have their embassy here. Right. You know. Well, the thing that mm -hmm. I find strange, though, is that here you have Reagan going through all these uh, dramatics, uh, showing this picture taken from uh, reconnaissance planes and so on, when all he has to do is to go to the island and it's open. In fact, I'm told there is as many U.S. Uh, citizens living right uh, adjacent to the uh, airport. airport or more U.S. citizens than there are Cubans. Isn't that okay. true? I mean, that, that is why... Uh, Was this quite purely dramatic on Reagan's part? Uh, it is those of us who know, because, you see, Grenada is such a small island, people did not know, and even now, 
they are not aware of it. It is very amusing, and that also shows how the propaganda can be so effective against the reality. Uh, this airport is no more than a picnic place anyone can go. There is a medical school, private medical school of US, where the US students are studying. And as you already mentioned, that uh, there are more US citizens tourists as well as these medical students who are already living there. If there are so many communists working there and there is a conspiracy, definitely it will be revealed sometime. There is no need really to have a plane taking the picture. Uh, the boats uh, always visiting. When I was there, US boat came. Any tourist could go and take right, it. Any tourist. <laughs> it is all open. Uh, the Canadian citizens uh, not only go there, some of them live there, and uh, there has been a big interview uh, where the Canadian ambassador, you know, living in Barbados. Uh, so I, I find quite honestly at time amusing, but most of the time uh, annoying that this propaganda can be so effective yeah. uh, and people would believe it. Well, this is not the first time that the airfield has come up for U.S. comment. In fact, uh, the, the remarks that were made by the president on the 23rd of March uh, seemed to be in conflict with, with statements that earlier statements that were made by other U.S. officials, uh, say on June in June, for example, where there were, this whole matter of the Grenada airfield was discussed quite thoroughly by the um, the U.S. Subcommittee on Inter-American Affairs. Uh, uh, don't you find it strange that you would, that you would have this kind of <laughs> situation developing? Uh, I. Um, you are quite correct that uh, the reason at this time, uh, I really don't find that strange that why so much uh, hit against Grenada is concerning airport, because they have to find certain things uh, to arouse the anti-Grenadian feelings. And one of them is airport, because it runs so parallel, if you remember, uh, with Cuba. You know, that at one time, when in that case, USSR was very directly involved and Cuba was accused of having, you know, even the missiles and all that. So it is on that line they are trying to say that Cuba, because of the Cuban help, Nicaragua, because of their revolution, Grenada, because of their revolution and Cuban help, then El Salvador. So in a way, they are trying to justify that really the communist conspiracy is taking place in this area, and let us have another Vietnam. But uh, when we go back, for example, to the comments that were made by U.S. officials before the, the U.S. Committee on Inter-American Affairs, mm. uh, on this question of whether or not the airfield uh, could be a, a threat uh, to U.S. Uh, strategic interests mm. or security interests, uh, isn't it so that the officials, the uh, air and navy officials, responded that there, there was no such threat? Yes, but I think... Uh, um, uh, one thing we ha do have to understand that uh, all these hearings and these reportings, which uh, Washington Post as well as the uh, New York Times, uh, when they report, uh, please do remember these reportings are not consistent. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, these hearings very often justify that perhaps the whole policy of Reagan administration is democratic and it is open and they are receptive. And if I really don't go too far, I would like to uh, tell you that it is more of cosmetic. The real policy concerning Latin America, especially Caribbean, is in the closed door, CIA-oriented. So these hearings really have no bearing what policy itself is going to be right. in its operation. Well, I want to turn to that, but I guess mm -hmm. what I was trying to bring out what, mm -hmm. was what appeared to me to be the obvious contradiction. Here you had... Uh, uh, you had evidence being uh, presented by one set of U.S. experts, military, presumably uh, military experts, air and naval experts, who were saying that it was no threat. And then, of course, you have Reagan in, uh, almost in what appears to be a, a 1983 version of McCarthyism, uh, uh, suggesting that, look, yes, all of a sudden it is a, uh, a threat. So I was really trying to zero in at the, at the apparent contradictions between what the president was saying on the one hand and what his military uh, people were saying on the other hand. But I'd like to turn now to what you were, you were suggesting a moment ago, and, uh, and that is uh, what is really going on behind the scenes with respect to 
uh, with the gr to, uh, to Grenada. It was suggested by the officials um, uh, after the Reagan remarks that uh, these, these were really just a context uh, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, create a, a favorable environment for a U.S.-backed invasion of, of Grenada. What evidence uh, are you aware of that could substantiate such a claim on the part of the Grenadian officials? The, uh, they are very systematic. And as Grenada is progressing towards constructions, U.S. reaction is becoming stronger towards destruction. They are running parallel. Uh, for example, the first was opposition to the revolution so that it could collapse. When it succeeded, and I would like to just put in here that uh, Grenada is the only geographical place in whole of the new world where productivity has increased according to the World Bank. Therefore, it came as a big shock to the U.S. administration that they could not really disregard Grenada. Then the evidences uh, go uh, like this. Uh, airport opposition, tourist cutback. Uh, next to that came OAS, for example, in, on February 24, 1982 in U.S., uh, Grenada was singled out by President Reagan. Mm -hmm. uh, in March 1982, it was again attacked in Barbados when uh, so-called Caribbean Basin Initiative was discussed. Uh, later on, uh, there has been interference uh, and open attempt from the U.S. official policy, and uh, I would like to point out here that not only President Reagan, Defense Secretary, and also the Foreign Secretary, they all spoke against Grenada, again considering a tiny island, only 110,000 people living there, and they uh, took the threat uh, against Grenada very much like Nicaragua. So if you see these systematic attempt, what they are trying to do, that they cannot tell Grenada alone as a great fighter of U.S. imperialism, against U.S. imperialism. So they are saying that it is going to be a base of Cuba, and Cuba is base of USSR, and then it is connected with Nicaragua, and Nicaragua is creating problem in El Salvador, and then gradually it would go to other places. So you can see it is a systematic apprehensive and full of propaganda so that people can really believe it, that Grenada is not a country, it is a satellite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Prime Minister Bishop in his remarks, I believe, on the very same night uh, that President Reagan made his address to the nation, mm -hmm. suggested to the Grenadian population that the uh, possibility of military intervention uh, uh, against uh, the revolutionary processes in the, the region, that is in Cuba, in Nicaragua, and in, in Grenada, seemed inevitable uh, to him. Uh, those of us who follow the uh, Time magazine and some of the other uh, periodicals see articles suggesting that the United States has been involved either directly or indirectly in, in fermenting problems for the governments there. Um, do you think that, uh, that this possibility of invasion is just an extension of, of, of U.S. involvement in these other countries? Uh, do you yes. agree, first of all, the U.S. is implicated in these other countries? Uh, the Yes. I do. Uh, and uh, here it is where the last year, um, Novel Vincent, uh, a trade unionist of Grenada, was invited by the Canadian trade unionist, and Oxfam uh, honored him, and there was a, a small gathering where he spoke, and in that, uh, that was my question. What would you do when you have Grenadian Bay of Pigs? And uh, he was really taken back, and he said, we are such a small country that there is not much we can do except try to fight our last man. And I very strongly believe whatever I have read and seen that because Grenada is the only English-speaking country where such a change has occurred, which has been very complimentary, definitely Grenada is considered far more important as far as U.S concerned in the terms of crushing Grenada, and I see all possibilities, for example, quoting Washington Post on February 27th, uh, it was already uh, stated in Washington Post that CIA planned to overthrow Grenadian revolution, which is uh, uh, unspecified measure is possible, 
So, I do not think that Maurice Bishop is really reacting purely uh, in desperation, there is a threat. And it is, and it is so easy because uh, just this country is so small that it can't sustain mm -hmm. uh, without. Well, now will. that the issue has been raised, I know Grenada raised this issue at the mm -hmm. United Nations uh, shortly after uh, the address by uh, Prime Minister Bishop and uh, President Reagan. Uh, do you think that the fact that the whole world is more or less watching for this to happen might act as a, a deterrent in terms of, or, or might somehow? offset some of the intended uh, plans of the U U.S. and other reactionary forces to destabilize Grenada? Uh, uh, this is the reason I must say that uh, Caribbean Information Group mm -hmm. is taking very active role to inform our fair-minded, sensitive people, the people who really care, uh, uh, at least, if nothing else, uh, against injustices, uh, the people who would like to honor the sovereignty and integrity of a country. And there is no doubt about it that a country which has seen uh, colonialism, slavery, exploitation for the first time trying to create some human dignity is sh and should be the pride of all the people in the world who really respect. And I must say that in this uh, matter like Latin American Information Group concerning Nicaragua and El Salvador, uh, Grenada is very, very important for all of us to be protected as the, with the help of moral help, goodwill, and it won't be out of place if I add that that is also very important for the people to understand that uh, a, a U.S. policy should be scrutinize very closely because the U.S., uh, South Africa is an ally. Namibia's question is being shunned. How is it that Grenada is such a big threat while the apartheid and the human rights and anything you name is not even touched? I think it is a, therefore it is very important for all of us. It is not Grenada alone. It is a question of uh, justice, equality, as well as fair play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you touched on some contradictions there, and uh, we don't have to look as far away as South Africa to see the contradictions in the position that the United States holds. If you look, for example, uh, uh, with respect to the United States' foreign uh, relations with other countries in the immediate proximity to, uh, to um, uh, Grenada, for example, we look to uh, the country of Guatemala. How, uh, do you, is it, uh, could you comment on the, the contradictions that are obvious there? Uh, I, I think... Uh, Really, for any person, it is so be obvious to see that what real threat for the USA is. The real threat is not airport. The real threat is not really the Cubans are there. The real threat is that a country like Grenada, in that proximity, as you earlier on said, where Haiti, Guatemala, uh, Jamaica even for that matter exists where election has taken place. With that poverty, it will work like a bomb because the people would rise. They would demand human dignity. Uh, the people in Haiti would not depend purely on begging and accept this uh, very repressive dictatorship. So actually the danger uh, for the U.S. as they see is, is not the airport. It is that it would affect all the poor people. And once we understand that the tension is not from Moscow or for Havana, tension is in the mind of those people who have been enslaved, repressed, denied, for the first time are demanding their human rights. Uh, I don't see really a U.S. policy any contradictory because I think the U.S. policy is quite open that human right is not our problem. American imperialism is our goal. Repression is not our problem. The status quo is our goal. So I personally don't see too much contradiction. I, I see it is a very consistent policy which should be understood by all of us. Mm -hmm. Well, now, uh, the United States and others, uh, critics of, uh, of Bishop, uh, have tried to raise uh, some uh, objections to uh, what is going on in the country. They suggest that uh, although Bishop might be considered to be a well-intentioned uh, 
uh, person and his government uh, well-intentioned, the price that Grenadians are being asked to pay with respect to uh, the political prisoners in the country and the suppression of the freedom of press is, uh, is too high of a price. How would you respond to people who, who raise these kinds of issues? Uh, uh, the, uh, first of all, the question of price. The, I have been in that country and also the American journalist that this government is popular. Limited number of people who are in the prison, they are not tortured, they have not been shot. A good few of them were involved in certain criminal activities. For example, one bomb exploded in 1980 and CIA involvement was there. Few people were arrested. Uh, the often uh, the question is brought in as that uh, prisoner as well as democracy and the free press. Now, I think it would have been really a very noble gesture if that particular ideology would have been applied to all places. Uh, if one is not really cynical, one sees that with that price, employment, free education, free health, dignity, women's liberation, uh, enthusiasm, building the country, uh, getting away from old colonial education, no brain drain, even if there was price involved, this price is nothing concerning, uh, uh, comparing with those countries where uh, there is no free press, again bringing Haiti, where there is no employment. I mean, in other words, if we are talking about the price, we should uh, use that rod of measurement to other places too. And another point which is important here, I think the, this idea that uh, U.S. government knows what is good for each country. Uh, it is about time it should be eradicated. You know, these countries are no more babies. They know what is good for them and don't know what they are doing. This dictation is very unfair. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I don't know if, uh, if the critics would be satisfied uh, uh, this, this whole question of freedom of press and, and free elections and so on, particularly in the West, there are uh, sacred uh, cows, uh, but uh, unfortunately we don't have uh, any more time left on today's program to be able to go into any more detail. Uh, I think you've been able to show that there is some need for vigilance on the part of Grenadians and indeed for Canadians like ourselves in terms of what is going on. Uh, I'm sure we'll watch this area with, with great interest. Uh, we want to thank you for appearing on the program. We want to thank you for watching. Join us next week. For just $3, you can buy a pack of five cards, sit home and switch to Lions TV Bingo on Dartmouth and Halifax Cable 10 for an hour of exciting home bingo action. Not only will you be helping the Dartmouth General Hospital and other community projects, but these cards give you a chance to win on two $500 games, one $2,000 game, with a possible $13,500 jackpot. That's Lions TV Bingo, Tuesday nights, 6.30 p.m. on Cable 10. For information, phone 463-6571. They're coming to Metro, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Musical Ride, in support of the Dartmouth General Hospital and Community Health Centre, June 2nd, Halifax Metro Centre. Tickets are available at any ATS outlet or at the Dartmouth General. That's the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Musical Ride. Don't miss it. War Amps Key Tags, symbol of our work in Atlantic Canada. Meet Sarah and Tina. As child amputees, they will have special needs quite different than others their age. From the latest myoelectric hands, to counseling, to the chance to meet other amputee children. No other organization in Canada can meet all these needs except the War Amps and our Child Amputee Program.
and only with your direct support of our key tag service. This is Dartmouth Cable TV, Community Channel 10. Welcome to another episode of Black Horizons. I'm your host, Hamrit Rashid. For the past uh, month, three young men from Beachville have been working on the Beachville Education and Awareness Program. In today's program, we'll talk to them about the activities in their program and discuss the historical and contemporary situation in the black community of Beachville. I have joining me on the program Paul Dorrington, who is the coordinator for the program, uh, Terry Dillion, a program worker, and Ivan Wright, who's also with the program. Gentlemen, welcome to the Black Horizons program. Not bad. Paul, I'd like to start with you first of all and ask you uh, when the program began and, and why. Why was the project started in Beachville? Our program began uh, February 28th and it will run, run for an eight month period. Uh, why our program was designed is to um, act as a vehicle to get the people in our community closer together and to, um, like, with a broad range of activities and events happening. Mm -hmm. Well now, uh, Terry, what are, the, what are some of the uh, objectives of the program? What are some of the things you've set for yourself, some of the things you want to accomplish in the eight or nine months that your program's going to be operating? Well, we feel like uh, we want to bring the people closer. That's our main objective, mm -hmm. is to bring the people closer, because we found, like, in past years that people have been slightly spreading apart, moving away from the community, and uh, like the community right now has nothing to offer the people, and we want to try and find something to offer the people to keep them in the community, because we find it a great community to live in, mm -hmm. but like it's not offering too much, so what's the sense of living there mm -hmm. or doing anything with it? Well, Ivan, what are some of the things, uh, some of the activities that you've, uh, you've uh, been involved in to try to change that situation? Uh, some of the activities uh, would include uh, basketball, um, swimming, uh, all sorts of recreation. Um, we don't have facilities right now to uh, exercise these things, but we invite ourselves out to, uh, into the city and to other programs which are happy you know, to take us in. And it's working out quite well so far. Mm -hmm. One of the projects that you're involved in, I know, is the publication of a weekly uh, newsletter. Uh -huh. I understand as a result of the research that you've done for that newsletter that you've uncovered a lot of things about the community that you didn't know before you got started on the program. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. What kinds of things, uh, Ivan, have uh, have come to mind that uh, you perhaps didn't uh, uh, have an understanding of before you got involved in the, in the newspaper? Uh, for one thing, I didn't know how old Beachville was, uh, which 165 years old, I, I just couldn't believe it. It's uh, and you work in archives, you find out uh, different things about uh, uh, lots of lands, how lands was, was granted to us, um, uh, some of the family names, how many people had lived in Beachville at one time or another, which was far more than there is right now. Um, and mm -hmm. it's well, we're going to talk a little bit later about uh, some of the circumstances surrounding the formation mm -hmm. of the community and its, its birthday and so on. Mm -hmm. What about you, uh, Terry? Were there things that uh, came to light as a result of the, your work on the newspaper that you didn't uh, know about the Beachville community before? Well, there were some things like, uh, for instance, the, the winter months we found in our, in our research that like, the snow during the winter was, I mean, like about 15 feet high. Like we heard that uh, uh, one person's house, the snow was right up to the roof, and like they had to climb one of their top window to get outside. And uh, we found the hard times were back then. They were very, very hard for the people 
to get through life. Mm -hmm. and now, this was information I guess you would have gleaned from what, talking to older people in the, in the, in the yes. community? along with uh, reading on books. Right. What, uh, tell us a bit about the format of the newsletter, uh, Paul. What kinds of things are you trying to cover in the newsletter? Well, we cover, we have a broad range in our newspaper. We cover uh, community news, which would range, it's, it's a wide range. Community news, cultural news, which would be announcements, what's happening in our other communities throughout our province, and um, sports news, which is what's happened to explain it itself. And uh, we also have church news, which tells us what's going on in other churches and what, what's coming up in the future. Right. Mm -hmm. What's involved in the production of your, of your newspaper? How, how do you do it? How do you get it out? Who does the writing and the printing and all that kind of stuff? Well, we all do a little bit of the writing. We, <laughs> we uh, <laughs> dig up what we can. Yeah. And uh, we have a few sources throughout other communities and in the churches. And, uh, People use the the people. We have a, we had a good response uh, for the newspaper from the people. Like it, people are t every time they see us, they're telling us news and you know what their daughters did or what they did, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, now how time consuming is it, uh, Terry, to put together a paper? Does it take you a lot of time to put the paper out? How much of your of your activities are around? I, it seems like quite an onerous responsibility to put out a weekly newspaper. Well, that's our, that's our first thing on the agenda at the top of the week. We start uh, Monday morning to get our information together, and we go right through Monday, Tuesday, and then Wednesday. We stick it together and see what it looks like. And then Thursday, Thursday morning, we get it typed up and ran off to hand out on Fridays. Uh, some weeks, well, a couple of weeks there in the last couple of weeks that we were going, it's been sort of iffy about what we're going to get in it, but we have found that people have been helping us to find information. And mm -hmm. it, can, it can almost be um, a 16-hour day, a job. Yeah. It's very demanding, like we have to keep digging mm -hmm. for sources, especially as a weekly thing. You have to keep uh, digging for new things, uh, different things, different information about the community. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a never-ending. I guess you're aided uh, in your task by Mrs. Dorrington here, who does a lot of the typing for you. I want to come back. Uh, we were talking about the, some of the activities. I didn't ask you, Ivan, about the range of people that are involved in the activities. Is, is it just primarily for young people in the community? Oh, no, no, no. We, uh, senior citizens, uh, people who are not senior citizens, housewives, anybody that's in the community or outside that wants to come out bowling or uh, uh, swimming or like we, we haven't started uh, arts and crafts or building things yet because uh, of facilities but we're going to get into that as the program goes on and uh, anyone that wants to come out we're glad to have them anyone sure how has uh -huh. the participation been? Now, you've only been going for about a month now. Uh -huh. I guess the, by the time the program's aired, it'll be four, one full month. Uh -huh. Is the participation at a level that you uh, would like it? or is, uh, How are the senior citizens, for example, responding? Are they quite active? Oh, yeah. Um, they, they sort of look forward to Wednesday for bowling, yes. um, calling and asking, double-checking, confirming to see if we're still going to the same place. Tuesday nights is also bowling. Uh -huh. um, it's a big response, good response. They come looking for us now. Uh, they want they want this to happen. It's a good thing. I hear you got a couple of senior citizen bowlers who are ready to issue a challenge to uh, <laughs> some uh, senior citizens from other communities. Is that right? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah. Well, it must keep you pretty busy, I guess, uh, with the paper and all of the activities at night and so on. It's almost uh, seems like a, a twelve or thirteen hour day for you. Yeah, I believe it. Uh -huh. Believe it. Yeah. Does we, we have to work through? Uh, I find myself working through the night sometimes, especially mm -hmm. on the newspaper. Yeah. On the newspaper. Right. Well, now, I understand uh, that uh, last week, from reading your, your last week's newspaper, that last week marked the 165th birthday of uh, Beachville. Uh, Terry, could you tell us something about the uh, circumstances that you discovered as a result of your research for that article surrounding the uh, settlement of the Beachville community? Well, in my, my personal research myself, I found that, well, the people that uh, have settled in Beachville were refugees from the 1812 war. war. Mm -hmm. And they were moved from the war to Melville Island, which is down around the Amdahl Yacht Club now. Mm -hmm. And in 1815, 1816, they, the city of Halifax 
decided to uh, grant some land to these people because the Melville Island was closing down. And they issued them land just on top of the Arm Hill there, which they called uh, Refugee Hill at first. And then they moved the moat further to what is now known as Beachville and in 18, 1816. Actually, so, excuse me, it was called uh, Beachville, Beach Hill at Beach first? Hill. Beach, Hill. Beach Hill at that time. Beach Hill. Beach Hill. Beach Hill. Mm -hmm. Well, now, I've heard that name. Oftentimes, people have speculated as to where that Beach Hill was. But Beach Hill is what is now Beachville. Beach. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, and it was... Uh, it wasn't as small as it was that now it, as it is now. It, uh, it stretched over miles of uh, land over uh, there. Seven mm -hmm. or eight, uh, seven miles yeah. anyway. Mm -hmm. It yeah. stretched out just there. What were the approximate uh, boundaries of the community in terms of some of the existing landmarks uh, at the time of settlement? Where did it begin and where did it end when the first, uh, the first settlement? It, it began back then at the head of the Prospect Road, which is... Uh, right, is it it where the highway is yeah, which, mm -hmm. When and they say when they say prospect, that's the old prospect road. Yeah, yeah. Old prospect it goes road. down f uh, even further than the the present day one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Down by uh, down by the the Halifax border, yeah. where you're just going to Halifax yeah. to the city of Halifax. Right. And how far out did it stretch? Uh, yeah. As far as Five Island Lake. Yeah. Right. Well, now what what size of community was there, and uh, what year again was it that it was settled? They were settled in eighteen between eighteen sixteen and eighteen eighteen. But the date that we have uh, found steady was 1818, March 27th. Right. Now, what size of settlement would there have been? You said that you, it, it was, it, was it larger numerically speaking in terms of people then? Than 80, than 89. 89 80, individuals or 89 families? 89 mm -hmm. individuals. Yeah. At, in 1818, there was the first 10 settlers mm -hmm. that were granted land, right. or licensed land, and with their families. The, with the families, along with the families, it was 89. 89 people. Mm -hmm. Well, now we hear about a lot of other people being settled in the province having difficulty with their land and so on. What was the situation with the people, Paul, who settled in in, uh, in Beachville? Were they given uh, out and out crown grants? Were they given license of occupancy? Or, or just how did they fare? Well, in 1818, if you're talking about that time? Yes. They were licensed land for a period. They weren't granted land. They were licensed land for a period of five years. Yes. And if they, uh, if they were productive on the land and acted as loyal subjects, then over the, over that, within that uh, five-year period, then they were granted deeds to the land. And apparently they kept up the land and uh, were peaceable, loyal subjects. So they did eventually get their titles to the land. Uh, they were, didn't go through the same fight as, say, blacks in some other communities where they had difficulty, they had to petition for their land and so on. As far as you know, they got their land granted out right yeah, after that. Yeah, eventually, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. What size holdings did they have? Is any indication of the size ten of the holdings? Ten acres each. Ten acres. Ten acres each. Uh -huh. Well, now, so that would have been ten acres for each of the eighty-nine, or no? Each of the ten families. Each of the ten. Each of the ten families. Uh -huh. So now, how did what? What about this? Was there some land that was held in common or something? If you say the boundary stretched from Prospect Road to well, what is now five. This hours. was this was when they first when they were first uh, licensed the land. They each got ten acres. Right. But then later on down the line, which is information that we can't find right now, but we're still looking. Uh, the land has stretched, and more people have moved in to the community to fulfill. I mean, to fill this all this area. I see. And uh, like the people that we have found, the black people from Beachville that lived there were living in the first part of Beachville, like from Prospect Road to uh, to uh, I'd say Rains Rains Hill. Yeah. And they were occupying that area, and uh, I would say that was about about 500 people between I, about the year of 1850, 1844, somewhere around there, to mm -hmm. early 1900s. So then there must have been some later migrations into the community. If you started with the original 89, mm -hmm. is there anything in your research that would tell you uh, where the other peoples have come from, or have you got that far yet? I think, just from my thoughts of looking through the history that we, we uh, um, researched, I think they came from Refugee Hill. Uh, Refugee Hill was 5,000 acres. Mm -hmm. At, um, around it's around Armdale Rotary now, where the Armdale Rotary is now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it was some 5,000 acres the blacks were granted. Mm -hmm. That was the land the blacks were granted. So they, apparently they came from that area and uh, Darius Road, Halifax. Right. Mm -hmm. Well now, Ivan, is there anything that's being done uh, in the Beachville community? Just uh, You were mentioning earlier that this was the 165th uh, birthday. Is there anything that, that's being done to commemorate that fact? Well, as of yet, uh, it was sort of come up on us as a surprise, right, because we were just researching and say, hey, this is a birthday. So what we plan to do is uh, this summer, uh, maybe start making plans 
and uh, a parade if possible, but we're going to have uh, a celebration yeah. uh, in Beachville. And possibly put a float in the uh, Halifax and Dartmouth Parade, yeah, publicizing yeah. the fact that this is our 165th year right. as a Christian. Right. What about the church in, in the community now? Is the church as old as the uh, is the church as old as the community itself? No, it isn't. The church was found, I think, in 1844. Mm -hmm. 1844. It was uh, yeah. Richard Preston. Who yeah, founded Richard the Preston was the founder mm -hmm. of the church, and uh, church has been a strong factor in our community. Yeah. Yeah. One of the active churches in the present mm -hmm. day yeah. African Baptist mm -hmm. Association. Yeah. Yeah. Well, do you know anything about uh, anything about the uh, the 25 or 30 year period between the time the community was settled and the time that Richard Preston did his organizing work in the in the community? Is there any indication what the uh, uh, the church activity was like in that intervening period? Well, um, there was somebody within the community who was doing taking care of the church services. I'm not sure if he was a reverend or anything, but he was taking care of the church services mm -hmm. until Richard Preston came. Yeah, yeah. The deacons just sort of, the old deacons just took over the services, and or they had a strong religious ground mm -hmm. back there. Now the church building, the the existing church building, is 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 that how old is that facility? Does that go back to the early days of the community, or is that a later the, uh, erection in the community? The existing. The existing church. So the existing church is. It's brand built, new, isn't it? Yeah, it's a brand new church. Yeah, it's been yeah, built in yeah. 1979. The right. old one that was torn down. Yes. I think that one was. Uh, that that's, was, yeah. that's pretty since, old. Since 1888. Yeah. 1888. Yeah. 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 That one. And as far as I thought, that was the oldest church. The oldest uh, Baptist church in Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let alone Canada, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. Well, I think you, there might have, Windsor might have might have created yeah. that. Uh, that perhaps. Right? Yeah. I, I'm not sure how old, but I think Windsor. I've heard somebody remark that Windsor has the oldest. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the oldest, certainly in the FNI Baptist Association, they have the oldest. I know that their mm -hmm. church predates mm -hmm. the association, which is over 127 uh, years old. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Paul, uh, Terry was talking earlier about some of the uh, interesting recollections that you've gotten from the older people. I guess you've done mm -hmm. a lot of chatting with them and so on. Yeah. Uh, I'd like for you to have you expand a little bit on on what Terry was mentioning earlier in terms of what the situation was like for these people. Can mm -hmm. you sort of go back and tell us a bit about what life was like for these earlier settlers in Beachville? Well, as Terry said, mentioned that the life life was hard. Like you hear them talking about that. Like you hear your parents talk about uh, how hard it was back in the, in those days, and we yeah. got it easy now. But, yeah. but it's yeah. in, doing these interviews, you know, you hear the rough times they had. Like for example, we interviewed Richard Hamilton. Mm -hmm. He's uh, uh, one of the elders in our community, and uh, he was telling us about that one of the common jobs back then was a coal handler. And once you get into that, but what a coal handler did, he worked on the fishing boats. And the fishing boats back then were operated by steam. And you had to have this, this, this boat loaded with coal at the bottom of it. So what, what, this was a common job for the black people back then. Mm -hmm. And so what, what his job was, what their job were, was, was to, uh, was down inside the boat, they were in the boat, while the coal was dumped into the chute, and they had to sort the coal evenly around the bottom of the boat. And he said at times, when, when the coal was first dumped into the bottom of the boat, you couldn't even breathe or see. You had to, you had to, you had to, uh, way around. Mm -hmm. They had a lamp, but yeah. there was no good, you couldn't see. Yeah, anything. the coal just just blinded you, and, and you were choked. always, always on your knees. Uh, mm -hmm. As soon as you got in there, with a foot of coal in there already. Yeah. And you were always on your hands and knees, spreading the coal around. Yeah, is there yeah. any indication of how common an occupation this was of the residents in, uh, in, uh, in Beachville? Was this something that quite a few people were involved in? Uh, we were down the registry of deeds and we seen an old deed of uh, and uh, one of the, a few of the occupations were coal handler yeah. on the deeds. Yeah. Yeah, so it was one of the and uh, getting back to the hard times, yeah. uh, like they were saying, Beachville is not too far from the city, but uh, another thing that the the senior citizens that we interviewed touched on, Hal Frammer and uh, Richard Hamilton, was that the, the harsh winters that they had back then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, like we think it's nothing now to drive in town, a hitchhike yeah. in town, but the winters were so hard back then that they would pack their stuff in, in the store shed in the spring or in the fall, and they wouldn't see Halifax or yeah. Christmas anymore Eve until Christmas Eve. Christmas would be the last Eve. time yep. they go into the city. After that, it was nothing until the spring. 
Mm -hmm. Spent all summer and all all uh, fall getting their salt fish in, salt meat, um, anything that you know they could preserve. Yeah. You know, bread, yeah. flour. Yeah. Of course, and in those days, I guess they'd have, they'd be quite a trip to town by horse. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And also, they lived uh, during the Great Depression. Uh, a few of our uh, people in our community lived off of uh, the called uh, ash barrels. Ash barrels, yeah. The, I guess we call them garbage bins now. Yeah. But they live off of some, you know, that. It was pretty hard in those days. Well, I guess in addition to the to the services that you're providing for to the community with the various programs for bowling and so on, this has also been a, an educational exercise for you as well. Very educational. Yeah. Yeah. Very, yeah. 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 We've learned a lot. Right. I have. Yeah, especially from the senior citizens' mm -hmm. right. point of view. Right. Now. Right. Well, in in the most recent edition of your newsletter, uh, commenting on the situation in uh, Beachville, the present-day situation in Beachville, uh, you stated that we are now a community in the midst of turmoil pertaining to the decrease in our population and the persistence of the city of Halifax trying to take over our prime land. What What's the background to that, Paul? Well, as you might have heard back years ago that our land was uh, almost during the um, Africville era. Yeah. Our land was under... The city was going to take it over then. It wanted to take it over, and uh, we're right now in the present time. Like that wasn't the first time, and then they tried again. Now this is the third time that they have. Tr they're try Right now it's in in court, and they're trying to take over our land. But uh, our community right now, it it's sort of the people is moving out, and it's it's not as strong as it used to be, mm -hmm. and it's. They're cutting it down. The city's slowly coming in and cutting it down. Like we were down the registry of deeds, and uh, we looked, you know, from the senior citizens telling us how how vast Beachville was in, the, in those days. We looked now at the registry of deeds, and you see that they've cut it off here, and they cut it off here. You know, the city's moving in further gradually. each time, gradually. Yeah. yeah. And uh, well, now, in the first occasions, when you say they, they, during the Africa period, which would take us back to the late '60s, uh -huh. uh, was there an open attempt to take the the the, the land, and, and how was that prevented? Well, it was prevented by the uh, strength of the community and uh, the leader of the church at the time, which is still is present, uh, Dr. Oliver. Oliver. And they mm -hmm. made petitions or something? To yeah, they had petitions and... Uh, what, what were they trying to do? They were trying to annex the land? Was that what uh -huh. they, were, they were going to do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What they wanted to do was to move Beachville all together. I just moved the, moved the community to another location. Yeah, I think it was Pockwalk at the time. They were yeah, Pockwalk. Uh -huh. So move the community further back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's around the Hammers Plains area. Right. And mm -hmm. when was the second time this, emer this emerged? Uh, I think that was around the 70s, wasn't it? Again in the 70s, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And again, a similar kind of... Uh, uh -huh. I think they, it was watershed. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, what's happening is the industrial park wants to grow, and by the industrial park growing, that means it's buying up all the land in Beachville. Uh -huh. Yeah. And the industrial park is sort of in the center of Beachville, uh -huh. and like it's it's <laughs> here and it's going down here yeah. three years, and then it's down here the next yeah. three years. Beachville's going to be in the center of the industrial park. Yeah. Right? And uh, three years ago, they they started filling in a little bit of our lake, yeah. and so our they're lake. growing up the side of the lake now and. Pretty soon, it's just going to be uh, not Lovett's Lake, but a uh, duck pond or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, this industrial park, is this a park located on land that was formerly owned by, by black yes, residents? Yes, it is. How did they acquire that land? Did they purchase it from people who were moving out of the well, community? Or? Um, it was owned by Mr. Bishop. Yeah, yeah. it was owned by Charles a Bishop. white man. It used to be farmland. I see. Mm -hmm. Farmland. Where but it was formerly Beachville, like... Beachville yeah, it was land. formerly Beachville, yeah. yeah. It was gra he was, he was granite the land. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mr. Bishop. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they just bought this one block up that was farmland and right. then they're gradually spreading out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, what about the zoning situation? Is the zoning such that it, that is it, is it residential zoning or what is Well, uh, in my studies last year while I was at Dalhousie yeah. and doing a project on Beachville, I went to uh, a map and at the McDonald Library and I found that in 1908 the land of Beachville was marked off as commercial land. Yes. So if it's commercial land, like I don't know how it how it was turned to commercial land without people knowing about it who were living back in Beachville in 1908. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what is the tell us something about the uh, the court battle now? Who is that be between? Is, are, is it the area residents who are carrying the court case? The the black residents of Beachville, or is it the residents generally in the uh, area? Municipal, municipal county. Uh, yeah. I have it in court. It's in the provincial court right now. I see. Uh, it's been in since. Uh, 
well, they, the, the city tried to annex in, in December 31st of 1982. So it's been in court since. I uh, they said it can go from one day to one year before they can have the final word. Yeah. Uh, and I think they, now they just want to take one side of the road of, of Beachville. But uh, what I think it is, I think they want to expand their industrial park more right. into Beachville. Well, now, what is the situation, the ownership situation? We know in the Africaville situation, there was a lot of problems with people not having um, clear title to their land mm -hmm. and that kind of thing, which kind of uh, mitigated against them in, in terms of their battle with the city of Halifax. Uh, do people in Beachville tend to have deeds to their property, clear titles? Yeah. As far as we know, they do. Mm -hmm. And we're well, trying to put that across to them right now yeah. mm -hmm. to get their deeds straight, right. straightened. Try to know what's going on, mm -hmm. get everything on paper, uh, and stand firm. For one thing, yeah. you have to stand firm. Right. Yeah. One thing, we don't want them to uh, take that dime when the man wants yeah. to pass it to them. Because yeah. we're so close to the city now, you know, it's the perfect spot. Yeah, it's prime yeah. land. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what kind of general concern is there in the community about the issue? Is it something that people are alive and alert to? Or? Well, they're alert to it, but they don't talk about it much. No. They no. try and just say, Avoid. forget it, you know. Yeah. Forget about it. So, is there any meetings or anything like that that takes place to discuss the issue? <laughs> yes, yes. There have, there have been several meetings, and the people have voiced their opinions. But uh, is there a committee or anything that's charged with looking over the uh, yeah. overseeing the issue? Mm -hmm. The church has been a, a major factor in the area. Leaders of the church and uh, leaders in the community, throughout the community. Right. Well, in the, in the closing minutes of the program, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about in a more general kind of way about uh, Beachville. For somebody, for example, who may be watching today's program who is not familiar with Beachville, has never been there, how would you describe, uh, how would you describe your community, the kinds of organizations that are there, what people are like, uh, what's, what's life like in, in, in Beachville? Oh, it's pretty low-key right now. There's a, the how many people, for example, would there be in Beachville, like present-day Beachville? How many families, roughly? There's about there's 390 people, that would be around about 70 or 80 families, maybe more. Mm -hmm. like yeah, maybe more. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Are they spread out different age groupings? Are they predominantly young people and old people, or is it a good cross-section? Dominantly group? young people. Right. Mm -hmm. And right. the uh, seniors, seniors are sort of getting, the numbers are kind of sort of going down yeah, slowly. But, uh, yeah. Well, what uh, what are some of the pluses for the community? We've talked a bit about the what a negative development that perhaps could seriously affect the future of the community. What are some of the pluses? What are the strong points about it? If you were going to promote Beachville and, and have people move there, what would be some of the pluses that you could think of? Uh, Our project. <laughs> well, program, <laughs> Besides right? your project, your program, of course. We have an uh, industrial park. Uh, there's work there. Uh, we, can, uh, we promote that. We have a church. We have a church center. Uh, you get to use that for recreation. Uh, you, go, you, you get housing there. You get uh, uh, co-op housing. Uh, you can build there. Uh, there's still people building the subdivision there. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, it's handy to the city. You can. It's you know, 50 minutes in, 50 minutes out. Mm -hmm. It's it's ideal. And also the atmosphere of the people. The people are close knit, and uh, you know, it's a good atmosphere. Very good. So it sounds as though the the people of Beachville have got a quite a valuable stake oh, in that yeah. particular mm -hmm. community yeah. uh, but the industrial park is kind of a two-edge kind of sort it provides employment on the one hand but it's kind of kind of strangling the community on the on the, on the other hand yeah. well now going to that uh, that industrial uh, center are there many blacks that are employed in the in the shops there no there isn't there's two that i know of right now two from the community and about five at the most from outside yeah mm -hmm. right. but they employ they employ a lot of employees from the surrounding communities like Lakeside and Chimley, but Beachville, you know, I've, myself, speaking for myself, I've applied there for many a summers while I was going to school and, you know, I only worked there for a week or so, you know, nothing right. is all from it. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you for being my guest today and talking a bit about the program. Just before we close out, I'd like to share a public service announcement with our viewers. Uh, there's a benefit dance that's going to be held at Mount St. Vincent's University on uh, April 9th from 7 to 1.30 p.m. The uh, dance uh, is uh, sponsored by the Rejuvenation Therapeutic Massage and Hydrotherapy Center, and it's an aid of the Canadian Association for Mentally Retarded. Uh, for people who might want to take in this event, tickets are available at Kelly Stereo Marts and at Zorro's Restaurant on 1560 Grafton Street in Halifax. 
We want to thank you for watching our program today. Come back next week.